Good afternoon. We're here on Monday, October 19th, 1998 at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts. In continuing our Veterans Oral History Project, we have the honor this afternoon of interviewing Mr. Roger L. Glover. Good afternoon, Mr. Glover. Good afternoon. Um, could I ask you just some uh, background information? Mm -hmm. What is your current address in Natick? In Natick. And how long have you lived there? 35 years. 35 years. And if you might, your age? 78. And you are married? Yes. Your wife's name? Fanny. And I Fanny. understand you have some children? Yes, two, a boy and a girl, and five grandchildren. Five grandchildren. Mm -hmm. um, in the 35 years that you've lived in Natick, have you seen some changes? Not really, not really, not in our area. You know, except the larger houses are going up around the different neighborhoods, that's about it. And what about Route 9? Route 9 is a monstrosity. <laughs> <laughs> and where were you born or raised? In Hyde Park, Massachusetts. And you were raised there also? Yes. Yeah. And did you have brothers and sisters? Two brothers. And what did your parents do? My father was a landscape gardener, and my mother didn't work. She raised her family? Yes. And did your brothers enter into the service at all? No, neither one. Were they younger or older than you? They were just, they're older, older than I were. What made you decide to move to Natick? Uh, truthfully, it was just a fly space to find the house we wanted. <laughs> and you had young children then? Yes, or? Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. When did you decide to enter the military? Well, I really didn't decide. I was drafted. You were drafted? Yes, yes. During World War II? During World War II. No. What age were you? 23. So after high school, what did you do? After high school, I uh, we moved to New York and uh, got a job with uh, F.W. Woolworths. So were you drafted out of New York? Yes. Mm -hmm. no. Were you single at that time? I got married at that time. You were married at yes. that time. Mm -hmm. And you got drafted. Did you have a choice at what branch of the service you would be drafted into? No. You did not no. have a choice? No, no choice. So Uncle Sam said? You go here. <laughs> and where did you go? Well, I went into Fort Dix first. And that was with the Army? With the Army, yeah. Did you get drafted with any friends or associates? No, not from that area, no. Were you given enough time to plan to leave as a young married man? Not really. You know, it was a give you a date and that was it. You just uh, reported and went. And what time in the 1940s was that? Yes, 43. So in 1943, you were drafted into the Army, sent to Fort Dix. Was this for your basic training? No, that was just uh, the first starting point. Basic training was Fort Leonardwood, Missouri. So how long were you in Missouri in your basic training? About uh, oh, a little less than a year. While you were doing this, was your wife at home? Yes. Was she working? Yes, yes she was. And what did she do? She was a uh, working for ER Squibb. Out of New York? Out of New York. Mm -hmm. Were you able to see her at all during your basic training? The, from Fort Dix, they sent us up to Camp Upton, and uh, I got lonely for her, so I went over the hill. <laughs> well, tell us about that. Now, where is Camp Upton? Up in upstate New York. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of the fellows got together, and they called a cab to meet us outside the gate. And we walked outside the gate, and there was a USO building across the street. And I figured I'd go into the ladies' room, because that would be the last place the uh, MPs would look. And all the other fellows went up in the attic. And I was getting in the MP truck, being arrested, and they were all looking down at me, thumbing their nose. <laughs> it was the first place they went was the ladies' room. I was a sergeant at that time. And when I got back to camp the next day, the captain says, uh, Sergeant Glover, you are now Private Glover. So I lost my three stripes. <laughs> How did you feel about that? Well, at that time, at the age and everything, it really didn't matter. You know, it didn't matter. So you went from a sergeant to a private. private, and you didn't get to see your wife? Not that time. Not no. that time. <laughs> um, 
after Camp Upton, that was that after that fact that you then went to Missouri? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what kind of training did you have in Missouri? All kinds of very bad training, up over steeples and down on through water and up to your neck with a 90-pound sack on your back. And uh, uh, well, they had the obstacle course, and then they had live ammunition on four corners of a, a big field with barbed wire over it so you couldn't stand up, and they were shooting live ammunition over us. That was one of the basic trainings. And you wouldn't allow, weren't allowed to even put your finger up because you'd lose it. Were there any casualties at that time? They were, not in my, that particular outfit I was with, but there were casualties. What was your outfit, by the way? Uh, 1310 combat engineers. How many were in that outfit? Oh, boy. Approximately. We had, uh, we had five companies in it, so it was quite a few men, quite a few. So how many were usually in a company? About 400. So you were training for combat. Mm -hmm. During that training, was there anything that sort of came to the forefront that you were specialized in? Uh, at that time, I was promoted to uh, regimental motor, motor sergeant. And what and did that was mean? in charge of uh, all the equipment, all the motorized equipment, saying that it was properly maintained, the drivers were properly trained, running the whole motor regime there. So that could mean the jeeps, the trucks? Jeeps, the trucks. Motorcycles, yeah, motorcycles, anything like that? We didn't that? have too many motorcycles, but no. uh, we had motorcycles. In fact, I had one, but uh, <laughs> you used to ride around the camp with it. <laughs> Riding around the camp on yeah. it, you had yeah. yourself. Yeah. During that period of time, what did you like or dislike about your everyday life? Uh, it was exciting. Every day was different. You never knew what you were going into, you know. And uh, you just had to get used to it. You know, you just couldn't panic or get Lonely, really. You were there and you were there, that's it. Yeah. So you're all in the same boat, yeah, so to speak? Yeah. yeah. When, did you, um, when did your duties begin to change? Or after Missouri, what, what happened? From Missouri, we went to uh, Alabama, which we just went down there to just to stay a while. That's all. I guess they were moving us around, didn't have any place for all the servicemen to stay. And then from there, we went back to uh, Fort Dix. And on the 40th, let's see, 1944, on uh, Christmas Eve, we boarded the Ile de France in New York Harbor, New York docks, rather. And they started up the engine, and the ship caught fire. So they, <laughs> they had to unload the whole ship, send us back to Fort Dix. And then New Year's Eve, we boarded the QE2. And it was a very eerie feeling to go down the, Char the Hudson River and not a light lit, not even you weren't allowed to smoke, of course, at all on the decks. But it was very eerie to go down the Hudson River and just see all black, nothing but black. So there you get, you get sort of a little leery about going, but there you, there wasn't any turning back. Sure. Yeah. Now, during that period of time in New York, prior to going out on the QE2, were you able to see your wife? No. You weren't. No. Did she know you were shipping out? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Did you know where you were going? No. But you knew we were probably going to Europe? Well, we had an idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had an idea. And then, of course, we went from New York into Glasgow. And we had to dock in the harbor because the harbor wasn't deep enough for the QE2 to get into the dock. So we had to go down on rope ladders off the sides of the ship and get into little dories. And they took us back and forth to the shoreline. When you reached Glasgow, had you ever traveled before like this? No. In your, in no. your youth? No. So you reached Glasgow. Was there a lot of devastation at that point in time? Could you tell there was a war going no, on? No, not in Glasgow. No, what, did you, no. what did you notice about the countryside there? It was beautiful. We, we really loved it over there. But uh, and they took us by train, and uh, we went down to uh, England. And there you could see the devastation. What was it like? What was it, did it impact you in any way in your group when you first saw it? England, and was it London area that you were in? Yes, outside of London. Well, yeah, yeah. Seeing the devastation. Oh, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal. What struck you most? Well, they had the, uh, the Germans had the U-2 bomb at that time, which was a flying missile. And you could see that go over you. It went over our camp. And then you could just wait and hear it hit 
somewhere in London and the whole ground just shook with how powerful it was. And how far away would you be from that bomb to we feel its shape? We uh, oh, I would say probably 100 miles away, uh, but you could still feel the vibration and it was, it was wicked, wicked. Did it make you nervous at all? Well, it did, it did. You know, everybody was uptight, very uptight, you know. In fact, we had a fellow that we knew was went to the theater that night, one of the nights, and uh, he was sitting in the theater, and the fellow right next to him got killed with a bomb hit, and he was perfectly all right. In the theater? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was brutal. And then, of course, the sirens were going on all the time, and you'd have to take cover to go underground somewhere, and, you know, they had all the volunteer fellows out there directing where to go. While you were in London, did you see many families or everyday life happening during oh, yeah, all of yeah. this? Yeah, everybody was moving along what they uh, you know ordinarily do. Yeah. Were you able to befriend any of the English? No, uh, they were very friendly people. No, we didn't get into action with them. You know, but they were very friendly people. Very friendly. Mm -hmm. And then from London, what happened? From London, all we did was to repair, uh, fix up the equipment for waterproofing because we knew we had to go into the water. So we had to take all the exhaust pipes and take a tubing and put them on so they'd be up straight out of the water when we did get under the water. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we went to uh, what they call a bivouac area. And from there we knew was, something was going on. And nobody knew anything, it was just get ready and here we go, you know. Mm -hmm. We went down to the seashore and they put us on these landing barges. And then we knew we were going to France. Going to France on yeah. the barges. Yeah. Do you remember what time? that was? No, I don't remember the time. Mm -hmm. It was daylight. 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 But uh, the rangers were stationed next to us in, in England and uh, they went out the day before and we didn't even hear them go out. We got up in the morning and they were gone. The rangers? Yeah. Now who would yeah. the rangers be? That was another outfit. Army mm -hmm. outfit. Army outfit yeah. from the U.S. Yes. Um, but mm -hmm. what they did with them, they used them sort of a decoy. They went up to another part of Normandy and the Germans expected everyone to land at that part and we landed down below. So Omaha. once the rangers left to go to Normandy, did you realize prior to boarding the, um, the boats that you would be going to Normandy? Oh yes. You knew that? Oh, yeah. 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 Did you know what the plan was? Did you have any idea what you were facing? No, we had no idea. No idea at all. The only thing, only thing that woke us up was if you looked up, you couldn't see the sky for planes and you couldn't see the water for boats. It was just amazing, amazing to see. There was so many, all of our planes and all of our boats were just headed for that one beach. And so walk us through that. Tell us about getting on the boats, how many were with you, what your sense we was, and then what happened. had probably maybe a hundred men on a, on, a, on a barge and the whole front of the barge would fold down so that it would sort of like a gangplank when you got to the beach. And then when you got to the beach, you just got off as fast as you can to keep walking and running, and, I mean, to get off the barge and get on the beach. When you get on the beach, just sit down and wait and see what's going on, you know, don't just try to go up the embankment. And we stayed there for two days. They had us with the, uh, their big guns. They had us, they finally knew we were landing there, and they sent down a whole lot of equipment. But we stayed two days on the beach, and then we worked them back, the infantry worked them back. We were able to get up into a field. And then we couldn't even set up tents or anything. We just had to scatter over the field. And I just happened to have a big compressor on the back of a truck that we pulled with wheels. And uh, I dove under that and we shell went right through the top of it. So it was very close, very close. We're gonna take a, a period of time right now to stop. I apologize, but um, we must stop. Backing up a little bit, Mr. Glover, going from Glasgow to Normandy, how long did it take to get over there? Well, we went from Glasgow to England. To England, I'm sorry. And yeah. then from England you went to Normandy. Yes, Normandy How Beach. long was the trip? I would say probably a little over an hour. Over an hour. Yeah. Was it rough seas? Very rough. Very was rough. there chatter on the, on the boat? You could have heard a pin drop. Everyone Outside was of the bombs that were going on, you know, on the, on, the, on the beach. But it was very, very quiet. You didn't know what you were into. You know, Do you, you remember what you were thinking at that time? Not really. Not really. No. 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 So you landed 
you, you were there for two days. During that two-day period, did you see an awful lot around you happening? Yeah, they had uh, bombed a lot of places around us, uh, residential homes, they were bombing, and uh, the streets, they were bombing, you know. And what about the beach itself? And I bring this up because this summer, as you know, one of the big events in the theater was the issue of Normandy and the movie that was Saving Private Ryan. Mm -hmm. A lot of people have had discussions about that. Have you seen the film? No, I didn't particularly want to go see it, actually. You know, but mm -hmm. uh, my son saw it, and he says, Dad, I don't know how you ever went through it. <laughs> but it's supposed to be quite true to what happened. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you remember visually experiencing anything when you landed on Normandy Beach? There were a lot of dead bodies around. You know, the fellow that hit the beach before us and uh, a lot of equipment that was abandoned, so we had to go through that. And it was sort of an incline to get up a hill to get to the field where we went after a couple of days. And then they start hitting us again. And uh, there was one time there was a gun that was going off. It was an 88, which the Germans had, which was a very powerful gun. And uh, they were bombing us just about every day and every night. And we couldn't, just about every night, we couldn't find out where it was coming from. Nobody could find out. So one morning, one of the fellows was on uh, kitchen duty, and he got up to go to the kitchen across the field. And there was a lake on the one side, and they had this gun mounted on an elevator, and I would go under the water in the daytime and then come up at night. And it just happened to be going down when he was walking along the road, and he let out a yell where it was. Well, then they came in without planes and just knocked him out there. But we couldn't figure out where it was. It was unbelievable. So for two days and nights, were you able to converse with each other, or eat, or sleep? We ate, yeah, and uh, sort of uh, one after the other. You know, you just couldn't all go to the mess hall together. You couldn't stay grouped together. You just had to scatter around, because if they hit you with a group, you'd be lose too many men. So my quarters was under the, the uh, compressor that I towed, you know? Mm -hmm. And you'd get out and go grab a bite and come back under there again. We couldn't set up tents or anything. It was just... Uh, they were just bombarding us. Did you find at that time you had mentioned loss of life? Were any of your associates or friends injured? No, or no we didn't lose anybody there. You were very yeah, fortunate. Very, very fortunate. Yeah, very fortunate. So then you, you, you mentioned earlier that you got up on a hill area, but you couldn't pitch tents. Mm. Why? Because they didn't want us grouped together too much. It was what they call a pup tent, which is a tent about that high, and you had to crawl into it. You know, the, we had the big tents that we put up when we got in safe zones, but this was a tent that individually every man had. Mm -hmm. So that was the only thing that we could put up. What was the weather like? It was foggy, foggy and hazy. Was it cold? It was cold. Yeah, damp, very damp. Yeah, very damp over there. Having gone through a fairly rigid basic training that you had alluded to earlier, did it prepare you in any way for what you found over there? Not under fire, no. The only under fire we went through those machine guns in the field, but that was nothing just to, you know, to show you what could happen. But we weren't uh, hit like we expected to, like we were hit. You know, they didn't show you anything like that. They had no way of knowing, you know. But uh, it was scary for a while. And then once you got beyond the beach, walk us through some of what had occurred then. Well, we uh, landed, they put us up on a field that we would set up tents, big, huge, larger tents. But the field was, oh, the mud must have been at least, I should say, three feet deep. So to cross to one side or the other, we had to use a tractor with the tractor wheels on it to get across to the tents to go eat. <laughs> That's how muddy it was. It just had to be a rainy season there and it was all mud. So we stayed there for a while. And you noticed, you mentioned again earlier, some of the devastation in the countryside. Yes. yes. Houses, yeah, yeah. buildings. Yeah. Tell us about that. Did you see any of the um, people that might live there? Were they in hiding? They were, yeah, they were a little skeptical about coming out. This is France, of course, and uh, the Germans had been there before us, so they didn't know who to trust, really, you know. But they were so happy to see the Americans because I guess the Germans really, you know, probably treated them a little differently. 
and uh, which they had whatever was left of their homes. The homes were pretty well devastated. And uh, they were uh, very, very backward at Forrest for a while. We did, as I say, they didn't trust anybody. You couldn't blame them. Did you have people in your unit that spoke French? No. No. Mm -hmm. They were pretty good with English. They were? Yeah, pretty good with English. Yeah. Good I'd make them understand, you know, and we'd understand them. They could make it so that you would understand, you know. And then how long were you in that area? We were there for, uh, I should say, probably a month. And then we went to uh, St. Valerie, which is another town. I'm sorry, what town? St. Valerie. St. Valerie. Yeah, we went there, and that was devastated. And then we went from there to St. Lowe, which was, the whole town was wiped out there. It was awful, awful there. So when you would go into some place like St. Lowe, and I think people are familiar with that particular town because of Musterfield in Framingham and having names of some of the key locations mm, in France. Mm. Were you following a unit? Were you going after the Germans? Or did you know where you were going? We were going after the Germans. And in fact, it was very funny because in, in one way, because the French were telling us that they were up on the top of a mountain and they could see us coming and they could see the Germans going. So they were cheering us on to come. And they're going, they're going. <laughs> so that was one comical part of it, but uh, it was uh, a little hairy there for a while, for a while. So when point. you were chasing them, um, did you get a lot of fire back from them? Not too much fire, no, because they were just moving along. But uh, then we had to join General Patton with his tanks, and we had to supply him with gas. And we supplied him for quite, quite some time, because he was chasing, chasing them right off the whole map. And uh, finally he said, uh, sorry fellas, he says, you're not using, moving fast enough for me. I gotta get planes to bring the gas. I'm moving too fast, which is why we couldn't keep up with him. Couldn't keep up with Did him. Did you meet him or see him at we all? We saw him, yeah. 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 He, was, was very, was, he was very, uh, to see him gave you a boost, you know? Because to see him standing up on his tank with his two pearl handle revolvers, you know, and come on, he was going, come on. And everybody said, let's go. You know, put some spirit in everybody. Sure. But that's the last that we saw him only that once. One other veteran had mentioned that while they were with General Patton, Patton, they had to dress appropriately with shirt and tie every day. He was a stickler. He Did you have to do that? Man. We weren't with him that long. Mm -hmm. No, he was just moving with his tank outfit. You mm -hmm. know, we supplied him with gas as long as we could, but we couldn't keep up with him. And while you were moving forward also, were you hearing anything else about other parts of um, the war, whether it be in Africa, North Africa, or other parts of Europe? Yeah, yeah, we began to get some news on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, get some news on it. And yeah. did you ever truly hear about the devastation at Normandy Beach right away, or was it more after the fact? It was after the fact, really, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And ranges. hearing about that, how did you feel? Well, we felt very sorry for the Rangers because they were stations right next door to us, and uh, they practically got all wiped out. It was just a they just looked using them like human guinea pigs, really. You know? mm -hmm. Whether they did it purposely or not, I don't know. They just made a mistake and had them land there. But it was, it was a ledge like that going up. There was no way they could get up there. And you know, it was just awful, awful. You know. Did you talk about it at all with your comrades, with your fellow soldiers? No, not really. Not really. There was mm -hmm. no reason to talk. We had to just keep going. Mm -hmm. You know, keep going. So once you, you said goodbye to General Patton and you had mentioned St. Valerie and St. Lowe. We lost a uh, commander in St. Lowe. He stepped on a mine. And one of the nicest guys you ever want to know. Captain. And this was your own commander? Yeah, Captain Gamble. Yeah. What went through the group when that happened? Really sad, really sad because he was a peach of a guy. But he, was, he warned everybody else to, to watch where you're walking because they had mines all over the place. And he had to go and step on a mine and just blew him apart. Yeah. So then when something like that happens, did you have confidence in the, n the next person taking over? Yes, yeah, we did. Yeah, we had good officers, mm -hmm. yeah, very good officers. So tell us more about then what would transpire after having something like that happen. You're still moving forward. Did you have a sense of where you were going? We didn't know the town. We just moved, that's all, until we get to the town, and that's what, what the better was, you know. And then once you reach a town, 
what would occur? Would you split up and go in different areas of the town? No, we all stayed together. You stayed together? Yeah, yeah, yeah. To secure the town, would that be the right terminology? Yes, in one way, yeah. Then we went to Paris. We went and they kept us on the outskirts of Paris at the time. In fact, we slept in stables down at the racetrack because they didn't have any room for us anywhere else. <laughs> but we stayed there a few days and then we moved on again. So during those days that you would stay there, what, what would you do? Would you write home? Would you rest? Would you? You could write home, yeah, you know, but there wasn't really much to, you know, you didn't want to say too much, and they censored a lot of the letters going out anyway. They didn't want too much to get out to what everybody was doing, you know. How often were you able to correspond with your wife and other members of your family? Oh, I wrote probably once a month, yeah, mm -hmm. once a month, yeah. Did you get mail from home? Yes, but we used to get it the stacks. You know, it would all come at once. It was held off somewhere and we'd finally get a stack of them, you know. Dates different. Mm -hmm. yeah. What about illness at that time? We didn't have any illness. No, we didn't have any illness at that time. No. A number of our, uh, of our interviewer, interviewees have mentioned the weather and the mud. We hear oh. so often the mud. Yeah, the mud was brutal. Brutal. And did it hamper your keeping the vehicles in top shape? Oh yes, yeah, it slowed us down a bit. It slowed mm -hmm. us down a lot, yeah. yeah. That was one of the reasons we couldn't keep up with Patton, too. We, it's just the mud we couldn't. <laughs> sure. Yeah. During that period of time, what do you feel were some of your greatest challenges? Especially while in combat, you were in the thick of it. Yeah, yeah. Just about thinking about getting home, that's all you thought about, you know. And then they begin to, we get, begin to lose a few fellows because at that time they had the point system. So fellows had been in their service before were with us and they were sending them back home. We have heard that term used quite a bit too, the point system. Would well, you like you know, to clarify what I, that I means? I think the way that worked was uh, so many years in and then you got a stripe and you put so many stripes on your, on your sleeve. And they, they kept record of it, of course. And then they would, uh, time would do that they would do to go home. Not like a recycling thing, you know. Mm -hmm. So they would send them home. The first thing you know, you got new fellows coming in, you know. So nobody really got that friendly, really, because it was all changing all the time. So know? it was difficult to maintain any yeah, friendships? Yeah, yeah. So you were on the outskirts of Paris, backing up a little bit. Mm -hmm. And then what? Then from there we went uh, further south in France. So between the time that you went in at the age of 21 in 1943, this is now 1944. Mm -hmm. Would it have been, so after Normandy, you said you were a month in Normandy. So between that period of time and the time you arrived in the south of France, how much time had transpired? Approximately. Well, about, probably about another six months. I six mean. months. Yeah. yeah. And we went down to Marseille, France, which was a gorgeous city. They didn't touch that at all. It was a beautiful city. So did you feel like you were almost in a vacation spot seeing sort something of, like that? Sort of, but not, not quite a vacation spot because it was still, action was still around, you know. Were you able to, at that period of time, were you able to have any kind of interaction with the French? And if so, did you, were you able to overcome any kind of cultural differences or was it just pure soldiers at war? No, they got very, very friendly. They got very friendly, they did, the French after that. So we began to visit them in the houses and stuff and so forth. And they made the, what they call was uh, something like a vodka. I say, oh, I can't think of the name of it now. It's very powerful. <laughs> it was homemade. but. Uh, then we'd exchange things with them. You know, we'd give them some of our liquor that we had. And they were very friendly people, mm -hmm. very friendly. Yeah. Yeah. So you were six months in France, or from Normandy to Marseille, approximately six months? Mm, probably, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little mm -hmm. bit more, yeah. And once you were in Marseille, what, what was your everyday or weekly cycle like? We didn't do much of anything in Marseille because there wasn't anything down there, any, uh, action as far as Germans are concerned, you know. They had a lot of underground, uh, the French had a lot of underground, which you had, and you couldn't get too friendly with them. You'd have to watch where you were going, you know. 
and then they loaded us on a, uh, a beautiful ship, which looked like a cruise ship, actually. And uh, we thought we were going home, but we headed for the Panama Canal. <laughs> and for what purpose? We were going to the Philippines. <laughs> so you weren't given a break at all? No. You were just going no. from one section to another? Yeah, yeah. The when did you realize you were going to the Philippines? Well, we got, as soon as we left the dock, the captain announced over the loudspeaker system that we still had to be on our P's and Q's because there were still submarines out there and no smoking on the decks and so forth. And then the day we got through the Panama Canal is the day that Truman dropped the bomb. And all ships this side of the canal were turned around and go up the coast to New York. And we missed it by one day. <laughs> And the captain was trying to hold back. He said, I want to be home as much as you fellas. He says, but wait, but there's no, no. He says, we got to go to Manila. I said, oh, so the <laughs> morale on the ship just went right down. Right down, yeah, yeah. because you were still in it. Yeah, yeah. So how long did it take you then to get to the Philippines? Uh, it was quite a long trip, quite a long trip, because we stopped in Panama for a couple of days. They let us go ashore, and uh, then we boarded the ship. And I forget how many days it was now. We landed in Manila, and of course the Japs were still going on down there. So we had to go through the whole routine again. No beach, nothing. We didn't have a beach to land on, but we had the cities and you know the towns. So they bivouacked us way outside of Manila. Did you confront a lot of Japanese at that period of time? Not really. No, they were up in the hills at that time, up in the mountains. And we had some fellows in our outfit that were really crazy fellows. They would do anything. So for sports on weekends when we were off. They'd go up in the mountains and hunt Japs. <laughs> Crazy bunch of guys. <laughs> yeah. And they would come back and tell stories? They'd come back and tell stories, yeah. When you heard that the bomb had been dropped, what was the sense of the, you and those around you? At oh, that time? everybody went crazy. Everybody, cheering oh, or? Cheering, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then did you hear about any of the casualties of that? No. Not no, until we, later on? Not until we got to, uh, to Manila. So how long were you in the Philippines? Well, I was in the Philippines. I imagine almost a year. Almost a year, yeah. So here you are thinking at one point that you're on a ship on the way home, but then you had another year to go. Mm, mm, yeah. Without a break. No breaks at all, except, you know, the, you, you get a pass to go to town, but then one, sure. you don't go here and don't go there, so it wasn't, it was useless. You might as well stay in camp, you know? What do you remember most vividly about your stay there? There again, the people were friendly, very friendly, and uh, we felt sorry for the little kids up there. They used to come down and raid our garbage pails at night because they were hungry and starving, really. Were you able to interact with Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. yeah it was and weird. what about the difference of weather versus well, it was very France. hot, very hot, very sticky and humid. So what you were affected with over in Europe was a total reversal of what you were That's being right. affected. And what about yeah. caring for your equipment, too? Yeah, the equipment had to be, uh, you know, taken care of anyway, but there wasn't anything like uh, antifreeze or anything like that to put in the radiators and whatnot, you know. It was just regular vehicles that you had to maintain. But, uh, during that period of time, were there any major battles that you and your troop were involved with? In no, no. Skirmishes? No, mm -hmm. no. We were very fortunate. Mm -hmm. yeah. But you were there for a whole year. About a year, yeah, yeah. And then they were building the Liberty ships, and I don't know whether you remember the Liberty ships, which was, uh, I forget the fellow's name that built them. They were all converted freighters, and they called them Liberty ships. And when it came time for us to go home, they, used, they sent some of the fellows by plane and some of the fellows by ship. And I was one of the unlucky ones who had to go by ship. <laughs> and that took us 45 days in rough, rough typhoon weather. And the ship, the ship was creaking and cracking and we had an old Swedish captain and he would sing songs all day long to us. And he said, don't mind fellas, this ship won't fall apart. I'll get you to San Francisco if I have to swim and tow it myself. Well, he kept us in good humor. Was there illness? Because I know typhoons can be fairly outrageous. Well, a few of the fellas got sick. Mm -hmm. I was one of the lucky ones I didn't, but uh, some of the fellas got sick. Uh, it was very, you, you, one, one minute you see nothing but sky and the next minute you see nothing but ocean. It was just amazing how those ships stood up. 
So you landed in San Francisco. Yeah. yeah. And went on leave. No, they uh, they uh, met us outside of the the bridge. They came out with a big boat, the Red Cross, and the band playing, and naturally everything made you know. And at that time in the Philippines, we had broken up all together. It was all units together on this ship. So it just so happened when we were getting off the ship that uh, all of us, I was a master sergeant then, and all of us were together at one time getting off the ship. So the girl at the gangplank says, my God, what kind of an outfit could this been? They're all master sergeants. <laughs> they were not the same outfit. <laughs> but then uh, they gave us a, a big meal that night, which we were very mad about actually because they had all the Germans serving us and they looked like healthy specimens. They said, here we got little skinny guys coming back from a war and these guys have been here living like kings. I mean, and were these prisoners of war that yeah, were serving you? Yeah, 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 they were prisoners of war. And that really, that really burned us, really burned us. And could you vent that frustration to anyone? Well, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you know, they didn't want you to start anything, you know, but fellows were doing a lot of mumbling, a lot of mumbling. A couple of fellows got in fights. But uh, he said, hey, it's not their fault, they don't know. You know, they're just an individual too, so. But it was hard to take, hard to take that was. Yeah. Look, after you were served your meal, at what point were you going to be disconnected from the service, or did you still have time left? Uh, we didn't get disconnected until we got to Frisco, mm -hmm. yeah. And then were you left on your own to get home? No, then there again some fellows flew and some fellows went by train. And there again I missed the plane <laughs> by train. <laughs> but you'd go down every morning and look at the bulletin board and see where your name was, you know, if you're going to fly or what time and so forth. The so were you going back to New York at that back point? Back to New York, yeah. And were you able to notify your wife? Yes, yes, yeah. I didn't know when I was going to get in, but she knew I was in Frisco. So you hadn't seen her for how long? Uh, a little over three years. Three years. Yeah, yeah. Was there exhaustion, excitement, both? H how were you feeling we after had... all of this time overseas? How were you feeling? Well, we looked like dead rats, I guess, because we were. they gave us so much medicine uh, for malaria down in the Philippines. And we all were yellow looking, you know, <laughs> horrible looking bunch of guys. But it finally wore off, and they told us it'll wear off. You know. This was the medicine, the effects of the medicine, medicine. not malaria. Yeah, yeah. No, no, you didn't come goodness. down with malaria. No, no thank goodness. Yeah. Did you lose weight while you were away? Uh, yeah, I did so. Yeah, mm -hmm. lost weight. Yeah. Before, let's talk about before you got to New York. What what things strike you? Whether it be humorous, I know you have mentioned your commander. That had to be a very thoughtful time for you, but. Thinking back at that three-year period, things that stand out, uh, a character that, that you met, or a special person, or a funny event? Mm -hmm. Well, I, in, in, uh, while I was stationed in Europe, my commander decided he met a little nurse and he was going to get married. So he asked me would I stand up for him. I said, sure. So we had to drive all night because she was in Antwerp. So we drove all night in a little open jeep and went up there for his wedding and they gave me a nice suite in the, in the hospital. She was a nurse, so she gave me a suite in the hospital while they got married, had their little honeymoon. And I just walked around town and talked to some of the Canadian, a lot of Canadian troops were up there then. And uh, I went and then coming back, we were on a highway and we, saw, I, we looked up and I said, there's a couple of German planes up there. And he says, oh boy, and it was circling around, you know, and I, all of a sudden they made a dive on us and you could see the bullets hitting the highway right near our jeep. I just, yeah. So I pulled off and both of us jumped out the jeep into a ditch which was alongside. So that was an experience that we had yeah, over there. Yeah. Was this the same commander who got killed or was no, it a different no, one? No, this was a different one. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. This fellow's name was Andreski. Did you feel that you were fortunate that you made it out alive? Very much so, very much so. Was it yeah. something that you dwelled on or just put aside? No, you never even thought of it. Mm -hmm. You never even thought of it. Yeah. Some fellas really dwelled on it, you know, but uh, I never thought, you know, I'm here, what are you going to do? You can't go home. Sure, you know? sure. So. Once you got to New York, tell us what happened then. You came well, in by train. How long were you on the train us, for? I think it took us three or four days by train. It was one of these slow, long troop trains, you know. And uh, then we arrived in Grand Central Station. and. 
From there, we had to go back to Fort Dix. <laughs> and discharge out of there. What was the first thing you remember after discharge? Mm. Just getting those papers, I guess, was the best, biggest thing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, did you have the... I've heard so many wonderful and touching stories, but then it's sort of like you had to get on with your life. Did you have a support group to talk with at that time? No. no. So you go back to New York, yeah. back to your wife who was working still? Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. she was still working. Yeah. And tell us then what, how you picked up after that. Uh, well, after I got out of the service, I uh, went into the post office, took an exam for the post office. You had to take an exam. Yeah. And you passed that. Passed that, and I got working at Radio City. The post Manhattan. office at Radio City. Yeah. Yeah. For how long? I was there for uh, about ten years. <coughs> but then I had to look for a house after I got out of the service, and at that time, Levitt was building Levitt Town in Long Island, so that was uh, veterans only. But to get there, we had to go out the night before and sit with a, a 55 gallon drum, make a fire in it to keep warm. So it was a first come, first serve basis. You know? So you had to be there the first thing in the morning. So we sat up there all night long around this barrel <laughs> talking about the service and so forth. Then we lined up, went in and signed up for the house. $90 down, the day you moved in, you got $90 back. <laughs> and so you got your first home in Levittown, yeah. Long Island, New yeah. York. Yeah. Ninety dollars yeah. down. Do you remember what your monthly payments were? Fifty-eight dollars, I believe it was. Yeah. And yeah. how long did you live there? Oh, we stayed there uh, quite a few years. Quite a few years. Yeah. So, would you take the train in for your I drove job? In. You drove. You know, I used in. to drive in uh, to Jamaica, Long Island, and then take the subway into Radio City. No, no. And at that point in time, did you have a family or start a family? No, didn't have a family then. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, started the family though. And then what made you decide to move to Massachusetts? I always wanted to get the uh, children back here in schools. You know, the New York schools are so-so, but uh, we don't want to get them back here in, in uh, Massachusetts schools. Once you arrived home in New York, you still had family in Hyde Park? My mother. Your mother. Yeah. What was it like for not only your wife and, and your mom, but others having you back after three years? It was a big celebration for mm -hmm. one thing, you know, you know, you know, we had a great time together. Yeah. How important do you feel serving in the military was for you and how do you feel it affected the rest of your life? Oh, I don't know whether it affected my life that much, but I, uh, it was one of those things you had to go, you had to go, you know, it wasn't maybe I shouldn't go or maybe I should go, it was you had to go. <laughs> what do you think, or, or because you got drafted and went through the experiences that you went through, what did you think then and how do you feel now regarding the whole war effort back then? Back then? Mm -hmm. Well, they say you had to go, you had to go, and it was your duty to go, you know. A lot of fellows were 4F and put on an act that they were sick, but, uh, you know, I guess it's, it's human nature. You know, it's human nature. A lot of us, a lot of the fellows were scared to death, actually. You know, it was, it was scary. But uh, I looked at it a different way, I guess. When you were coming back into the States and you mentioned the band and the celebration, and I'm sure a lot of flag waving. Oh, yeah, yeah. How did you... How did you feel about that? Oh, that was wonderful. That mm -hmm. was a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Was it emotional for you? Very much so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. One of the questions that I ask a number of the veterans during this interviewing process is if you feel there was a difference or what you feel about the difference of public opinion regarding the veterans of your generation in World War II, those affected by the Korean conflict and those of the Vietnam War era. Mm. Would you like to talk about that at all? Well, I don't know. We were most of drafted, and the fellows, of course, Vietnam and, and uh, the other war was uh, mostly volunteers, but they did have a lot of drafting in that, too. You know? But 
uh, we had more of a goal, I think, to uh, fight for than those fellows did. You know, there was this fellow was just fighting one race in one country. We were fighting, you know, several countries, and it was a different, different thing altogether. You know. And finally, is there any thought, memory, or comment that you'd like to make, not only to share possibly with your family and the community, but with those who will be reviewing this tape for research purposes in the future? No, just that they stuck with me <laughs> all the time. That's about it. Your family. Yeah. 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 The wife is 55 years, 56 years now we've been married, so. Yeah. That's a long time. Long time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I put up with it, but it's a long time. <laughs> she hear me say that. <laughs> well, we would like to thank you for sharing some of your experiences with us. I know it will be greatly appreciated not only now but in the in the near future mm -hmm. too. Um, thank you very much Mr. Glover for coming in today. Thank you. Okay. It's a pleasure. Thanks.